Okay, so as always, here is the guide for reference. We are starting off with Tower of Dawn, chapter 12. Um, sorry, I just started reading the chapter in my head because I couldn't remember where we left off. Um, so we are, on, we are on Tower of Dawn, chapter 12. So we are going to be reading this chapter and then we will be switching back over to Empire of Stars for a couple chapters and then back up to Tower of Dawn if we get that far. So... Everybody reading along, get your Tower of Dawn books out, chapter 12. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> hold on, hold on. There we go. Knew something was wrong. Chapter 12. Burning, razor-sharp pain sliced down his back in brutal claws. Kale arced, bellowing in agony. Irene's hand was instantly gone, and a crashing sounded. Kale panted, gasping, as he pushed up onto his elbows to find Irene sitting on the low-lying table, her vial of oil overturned and leaking across the wood. She gaped at his back, at where her hand had been. He had no words, none beyond the echoing pain. Irene lifted her hands before her face as if she had never seen them before. She turned them this way and that. It just do it doesn't just dislike my magic, she breathed. His arms buckled, so he lay down again on the cushions, holding her stare as Irene declared. It hates my magic. You said it was an echo not connected to the injury. Maybe I was wrong. Rowan healed me with none of those problems. Her brows nodded at the name, and he silently cursed himself for revealing that piece of his history in this place of ears and mouths. Were you unconscious? Were you conscious? He considered. No, I was nearly dead. She noticed the spilled oil then and cursed softly, mildly, compared to some other filthy mouths he had the distinct pleasure of being around. Irene lunged for her satchel, but he moved faster, grabbing his sweat-damp shirt from where he laid it on the sofa arm and chucking it over the spreading puddle before it could drip onto the surely priceless rug. Irene studied the shirt, then his outstretched arm, now nearly across her lap, Either your lack of consciousness during that initial healing kept you from feeling this sort of pain, or perhaps whatever this had not settled. His throat clogged. You think I'm possessed by that thing that had dwelled inside the king that had done such unspeakable things? No, but pain can feel alive. Maybe this is no different. And maybe it does not want to let go. Is my spine even injured? He barely managed to ask the question. It is, she said, and some part of his chest caved in. I sensed the broken bits, the tangled and severed nerves. But to heal those things, to get them communicating with your brain again. I need to get past that echo, or beat it into submission enough to have space to work on you. Her lips pressed into a grim line. This shadow, this thing that haunts you, your body, it will fight me every step of the way. Fight to convince you to tell me to stop. Through pain. Her eyes were clear. Stark. Do you understand what I am telling you? His voice was low, rough. That if you are to succeed, I will have to endure that sort of pain repeatedly I have herbs that can make you sleep but with an injury like this I think I won't be the only one who has to fight back against it and if you are unconscious I fear what it might try to do to you if you were trapped there in your dreamscape your psyche one moment while we take care of something real quick Okay. 
Never mind. Her face seemed to pale further. Hale slid his hand from where it still rested atop his shirt-turned mop and squeezed her hand. Do what you have to. It will hurt. Like that. Constantly. Worse likely. I will have to work my way down, vertebrae by vertebrae, before I can even reach the base of your spine, fighting it and healing you at the same time. His hand tightened on hers, so small compared to his. Do what you have to, he repeated. And you, she said quietly, you will have to fight it as well. He stilled at that. Irene went on. If these things feed upon us by nature, if they feed and yet you are healthy, she gestured to his body, then it must be feeding upon something else, something within you. I sense nothing. She studied their joined hands, then slid her fingers away. Not as violent as dropping his hand, but the withdrawal was pointed enough. Perhaps we should discuss it. Discuss what? She brushed her hair over her shoulder. What happened? Whatever it is that you feed this thing. Sweat coated his palms. There is nothing to discuss. Irene stared at him for a long moment. It was all he could do not to shrink away from that gaze. From what I've gleaned, there is quite a bit to discuss regarding the past few months. It seems as if it's been a tumultuous time for you recently. You yourself said yesterday there is no one that loathes you more than yourself, to say the least. And you're suddenly so eager to hear about it? She didn't so much as flinch. If that is what is required for you to heal and be gone? His brows rose. Well then, it finally comes out. Irene's face was an unreadable mask that could, be, that could have given Dorian a run for his money. I assume you do not wish to be here forever. What with war breaking loose in our homeland, as you called it. Is it not our homeland? Silently, Irene rose to grab her satchel. I have no interest in sharing anything with Adderlin. He understood. He really did. Perhaps it was why he still had not told her who exactly that lingering darkness belonged to. And you, Irene went on are avoiding the topic at hand. She rooted through her satchel. You'll have to talk about what happens sooner or later. With all due respect, it's none of your business. Her eyes flicked to him at that. You would be surprised by how closely the healing of physical wounds is tied to the healing of emotional ones. I faced what happened. Then what is that thing in your spine feeding on? I don't know. He didn't care. She fished something out of the satchel at last, and when she strode back toward him, his stomach tightened at what she held. A bit, crafted from dark, fresh leather, unused. She offered it to him without hesitation. How many times had she handed one over to patients, to heal injuries far worse than his? Now would be the time to tell me to stop, Irene said, face grim, in case you'd rather discuss what happened these past few months. Kale, Kale only lay on his stomach and slid the bit into his mouth. Nesrin had watched the sun rise from the skies. She'd found Prince Sartak waiting in his airy in the hour before dawn. The minaret was open to the elements at its uppermost level. And behind the leather-clad prince, Nesrin had braced a hand on the archway of the stairwell, still breathless from the climb. Kadara was beautiful. Each of the roof's golden feathers shone like burnished metal, the white of her breast bright as fresh snow, and her gold eyes had sized Nesrin up immediately, before Sartak even turned from where he'd been buckling on the saddle across her back. Captain Felique, the prince had said by way of greeting, you're up early. Casual words for any listening ears. The storm last night kept me from sleep. I hope I'm not disturbing you. On the contrary. In the dim light, his mouth quirked in a smile. I was about to go for a ride, to let this fat hog hunt for her breakfast for once. Kadara puffed her feathers in indignation. 
clicking her enormous beak, fully capable of taking a man's head off in one snip. No wonder Princess Hussar remained wary of the bird. Sartak chuckled, patting her feathers. Care to join? With the words, Nasrin suddenly had a sense of how very, very high the minaret was, and how Katara would likely f fly above it. With nothing to keep her from death but the rider and saddle now set in place. But to ride a rook. Even better, to ride a rook with a prince who might have information for them. I am not particularly skilled with heights, but it would be my honor, prince. It had been a matter of a few minutes. Sartak had ordered her to switch from her midnight blue jacket to the spare leather one folded in a chest of drawers shoved against the far wall. He'd politely turned his back when she changed pants as well. Since her hair fell only to her shoulders, she had difficulty braiding it back, but the prince had fished into his own pockets and supplied her with a leather thong to pull it back into a knot. Always carry a spare, he told her, or else she'd be coming her hair for weeks. He'd mounted the keen-eyed rook first, Kadara lowering herself like some oversized hen to the floor. He climbed her side in two fluid movements, then reached down a hand for Nesrin. She gingerly laid her palm against Kadara's ribs, marveling at the cool feathers smooth as fin finest silk. Nesrin waited for the rook to shift about and glare while Sartak hauled her into the saddle in front of him, but the prince's mount remained docile, patient. Sartak had buckled and harnessed them both into the saddle, triple-checking the leather straps. Then he clicked his tongue once, and... Nesrin knew it wasn't polite to squeeze a prince's arm so hard the bone was likely to break. But she did so anyway as Kadara spread her shining golden wings and leaped out. Leaped down. Her stomach shot straight up her throat. Her eyes watered and blurred. Wind tore at her, trying to rip her from that saddle, and she clenched with her thighs so tightly they ached, while she gripped Sartak's arms, holding the reins so hard he chuckled in her ear. But the pale buildings of Antica loomed up, near blue in the early dawn, rushing to meet them as Katara dove and dove, a star falling from the heavens, then flared those wings wide and shot upward. Nasrin was glad she had forgone breakfast. For surely it would have come spewing out of her mouth at what the motion did to her stomach. Within the span of a few beats, Kadara banked right, toward the horizon just turning pink. The sprawl of Antica spread before them, smaller and smaller as they rose into the skies, until it was no more than a cobblestoned road beneath them, spreading into every direction, until she could spy the olive groves and wheat fields just outside the city. The country estates and small towns speckled about. The rippling dunes of the northern desert to her left. The sparkling, snaking band of rivers turning golden in the rising sun that crested over the mountains to her right. Sartak did not speak, did not point out landmarks, not even the pale line of the sister road that ran toward the southern horizon. No. In the rising light, he let Kadara have her head. The rook took them floating higher still, the air turning crisp, the awakening blue sky brightening with each mighty flap of her wings. Open. So open. Not at all like the endless sea, the tedious waves and cramped ship. This was... This was breath. This was... She could not look fast enough, drink it all in. How small everything was, how lovely and pristine. A land claimed by a conquering nation, yet loved and nurtured. Her land. Her home. The sun and the scrub, and the undulating grasslands that beckoned in the distance. The lush jungles and rice fields to the west. The pale sand dunes of the desert to the northeast. More than she could see in a lifetime. Farther than Kadara could fly in a single day. An entire world, this land. This entire world contained here. She could not understand why her father had left. Why he had stayed when such darkness had crept into Adderlin. Why he had kept them in that festering city where she so rarely looked up at the sky. Or felt a breeze that did not reek of the briny Avery or the rubbish rotting in the streets. You are quiet, the prince said. And it was more question than statement. Nesrin admitted in Halha. 
I don't have words to describe it. She felt Sartak's smile near her shoulder. That is what I felt, that first ride, and every ride since. I understand why you stayed at the camp those years ago, why you are eager to return. A beat of quiet. Am I so easy to read? How could you not wish to return? Some consider my father's palace to be the finest in the world. It is. His silence was question enough. Rifthold's palace was nothing so fine, so lovely and a part of the land. Sartak hummed, the sound reverberating into her back. Then he said quietly, The death of my sister has been hard upon my mother. It is for her that I remain. Nesrin winced a bit. I'm so very sorry. Only the rushing wind spoke for a time. Then Sartak said, You said was, regarding Rifthold's royal palace. Why? You heard what befell it, the glass portions. Ah, another beat of quiet. Shattered by the Queen of Terrasin, your ally. My friend. He craned his body around hers to peer at her face. Is she truly? She is a good woman, Nesrin said, and meant it. Difficult, yes. But some might say the same of any royalty. Apparently, she found the former king of Adderland so difficult that she killed him. Careful words. The man was a monster, and a threat to all. His second, Parrington, remains that way. She did Aurelia a favor. Sartak angled the reins as Katara began to slow began a slow, steady descent toward a sparkling river valley. She is truly that powerful? Nesrin debated the merits of the truth, or downplaying Aelin's might. She and Dorian both possess considerable magic, but I would say it is their intelligence that is the stronger weapon. Brute power is useless without it. It's dangerous without it. Yes, Nesrin agreed, swallowing. Are... She had not been trained in the maze-like way of speaking at court. Is there such a threat within your court that warranted us needing to speak in the skies? He could very well be the threat posed, she reminded herself. You have dined with my siblings. You see how they are. If I were to arrange a meeting with you, it would send a message to them. That I am willing to hear your suit. Perhaps press it to our father. They would consider the risks and benefits of undermining me or whether it would make them look better to try to join my side. And are you willing to hear us out? Sartag didn't answer for a long moment, only the screaming wind filling the quiet. I would listen to you and Lord Westfall. I would hear what you know, what has happened to you both. I do not hold as much sway with my father as others, but he knows the roof riders are loyal to me. I thought that I was his favorite, a low, better laugh. I perhaps stand a chance at being named heir, but the Kagan does not select his heir based on whom he loves best. Even so, that particular honor goes to Duva and Kashin. Sweet-faced Duva, she could understand, but... Kashin? He is loyal to my father to a fault. He has never schemed, never backstabbed. I've done it. Plotted and maneuvered against them all to get what I want. But Kashin... He may command the land armies and the horse lords. He may be brutal when required, but with my father, he is guileless. There has never been a more loving or loyal son. When our father dies, I worry what the others will do to caution if he does not submit, or worse, what his death will do to caution himself. She dared ask. What would you do to him? Destroy him if he will not swear fealty? It remains to be seen what sort of threat or alliance he could pose. Only Duva and Argon are married, and Argon has yet to sire offspring. Though Caution, if he has his way, would likely sweep that young healer off her feet. Irene. Strange that she has no interest in him. A mark in her favor. It is not easy to love a Kagan's offspring. The green grasses, still dewy beneath the fresh sun, rippled as Kadara swept toward a swift-moving river. With those enormous talons of hers, she could easily snatch up fistfuls of fish. But it was not the prey 
Kadara sought as she flew over the river, seeking something. Someone broke into the Torres library last night, Sartak said, as he monitored the roots hunt over the dark blue waters. Mist off the surface kissed Nesrin's face, but the chill of his words went far deeper. They killed a healer, through some vile power that rendered her into a husk. We have never seen its like in Antica. Nesrin's stomach turned over. With that description? Who? Why? Irene Towers sounded the alarm. We searched for hours and found no trace, beyond missing books from where she had been studying, and where it stalked her. Irene was rattled, but fine. Researching. Kale had informed her last night that Irene had planned to do some research regarding wounds from magic. From demons. Sartak asked casually. Do you know what Irene might have been looking into that posed such dark interest and in theft of her books? Irene, Nesrin considered. It could be a trick, his revealing something personal from his family, his life to lull her into telling him secrets. Nesrin and Kale had not yielded any information of the keys, the Volg, or Erewhon to the Kaganora's children. They had been waiting to do so, to assess whom to trust. For if their enemies heard that they were hunting for the keys to seal the word gate. No, she lied. But perhaps they are unannounced enemies of ours, who wish to scare her and the other healers out of helping the captain. I mean, Lord Westfall. Silence. She thought he'd push her on it. Waited for it. As Kadara skimmed closer to the river's surface, as if closing in on some prey. It must be strange to bear a new title with the former owner right beside you. I was only captain for a few weeks before we left. I suppose I shall have to learn when I return. If Irene is successful, among other possible victories. Like bringing that army with them. Yes, was all she managed to say. Kadara dove, a sharp, swift motion that had Sartak tightening his arms around her, bracing her thighs with his own. She let him guide her, keeping them upright in the saddle as Kadara dipped into the water, thrashed, and sent something hurling onto the riverbank. A heartbeat later, she was upon it, talons and beaks spearing and slashing. The thing beneath her fought, twisting and whipping. A crunch, then silence. The root calmed, feathers puffing, then smoothing against the blood now splattered along her breast and neck. Some had splashed onto Nesrin's boots as well. Be careful, Captain Philippe, Sartak said as Nasrin got a good look at the creature the roof now feasted upon. It was enormous, nearly fifteen feet, covered in scales thick as armor, like the marsh beasts of Eelway, but bulkier, fatter from the cattle it no doubt dragged into the water along these rivers. There is beauty in my father's lands, the prince went on while Kadara ripped into that monstrous carcass. But there is much lurking beneath the surface, too. And that was chapter 12 of Tower of Dawn. You have a hydrate and cat ears. I have a hydrate and cat ears? Okay. Well, hydrate is perfect timing. Did avocado come in here? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even notice. <laughs> I was just like, see you guys talking about a dog. I took extra sips for your hydrate. Also, cat ears. Typically, I wear them for 10 minutes, but for reading streams, I will wear them for one chapter. As long as that chapter isn't only one page long, obviously. As long as it is of normal chapter length. Because if I wear these for too long, they give me a headache. So I don't want to wear them, you know, too, too long. Also, it seems like the Wi-Fi is holding up pretty well. Not too much of a delay on this side. That's good. Like, I'm seeing it. I have it pulled up on my other monitor as well. Um, because I forgot to close it. And it, it seems pretty good. It seems pretty good. I'll have to run a speed test. Like, it's pretty average to the what the delay usually is. Okay. That's good. Also, Mom, I don't know if you have to speed out of here. Uh, tonight after stream, but can we talk camera? Yes. I picked one out. Okay. It's not that expensive. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Sorry, it just, 
adjusting it reminded me, and I I remember every time. Yep. Um. Okay. So that was chapter twelve of Tower of Dawn. Now we are going to be switching over to Empire of Storms. Where's my pen? Um. Okay. Oh, also, I forgot to mention at the beginning of the stream, I, once I get memberships figured out, also, I'm going to try dual streaming. Streaming to both YouTube and to Twitch. Okay. Those following along, get your Empire of Storm books out and turn to pay, or to chapter 17, aka page 157, because I started saying that. <clears throat> Okay. Whew. Empire of Storms, Chapter 17. Manon Blackbeak watched the black skies above Morath bleed to rotted gray on the last morning of Asterin's life. She had not slept the entirety of the night, had not eaten or drank, had done nothing but sharpen wind cleaver in the frigid openness of the wyvern's airy. Over and over she had honed the blade, leaning against Abraxos's warm side until her fingers were too stiff with cold to grip sword or stone. Her grandmother had ordered Astron locked in the deepest bowels of the keep's dungeon, so heavily guarded that escape was impossible, or rescue. Manon had toyed with the idea for the first few hours after the sentence had been given, but to rescue Astron would be to betray her matron, her clan, her mistake, it was her own mistake, her own damned choices that had led to this. And if she stepped out of line again, the rest of the Thirteen would be put down. She was lucky she hadn't been stripped of her title as wing leader. At least she could still lead her people, protect them. Better than allowing someone like Iskra to take command. The Varian Gap Legion's assault on Rifthold under Iskra's command had been sloppy, chaotic, not the systematic, careful sacking Manon would have planned, had they asked her. It made no difference now whether the city was in full or half ruin. It didn't alter Asterin's fate. So there was little to be done, other than to sharpen her ancient blade and memorize the words of request. Manon would have to utter them at the right moment. This last gift she could give her cousin. Her only gift. Not the long, slow torture and beheading that was typical of a witch execution but the swift mercy of Manon's own blade. Boots scuffed on stone and crunched the hay littering the airy floor. Manon knew that step, knew it as well as Asterin's own gait. What? She said to Sorrel without looking behind her. Dawn approaches, her third said. Soon to be second. Vesta would become third and... And maybe Astrid would at last see that hunter of hers. See the stillborn witchling they'd had together. Never again would Astrid ride the winds. Never again would Astrid soar on the back of her sky-blue mare. Manon's eyes slid to the wyvern across the airy, shifting on her two legs, awake when the others were not. As if she could sense her mistress's doom beckoning with each passing moment. What would become of the mare when Astrid was gone? Manon rose to her feet, Abraxos nudging the backs of her thighs with his snout. She reached down, brushing his scaling head. She didn't know who it was meant to comfort. Her crimson cape, as bloody and filthy as the rest of her, was still clasped at her collarbone. The thirteen would become twelve. Manon met Sek Sorrel's gaze, but her third's attention was on Windcleaver, bare in Manon's hand. Her third said, you mean to make the words of request? Manon tried to speak, but she could not open her mouth, so she only nodded. Sorrel stared toward the open archway beyond Abraxos. I wish she had the chance to see the wastes, just once. Manon forced herself to lift her chin. We do not wish, we do not hope, she said to her soon to be second. Sorrel's eyes snapped to her, something like hurt flashing there. Manon took the inner blow. 
she said. We will move on. Adapt. Sorrel said quietly, but not weakly. She goes to her death to keep your secrets. It was the closest Sorrel had ever come to outright challenge. To resentment. Manon sheathed Wind Cleaver at her side and strode for the stairwell, unable to meet Abraxas's curious stare. Then she will have served me well a second, and will be remembered for it. Sorrel said nothing. So Manon descended into the gloom of Morath to kill her cousin. The execution was not to be held in the dungeon. Rather, her grandmother had selected a broad veranda overlooking one of the endless drops into the ravine curled around Morath. Witches were crowded onto the balcony, practically thrumming with bloodlust. The matrons stood before the gathered group, Persita and the Yellowlegs matron flanked by each of their heirs, all facing the open doors through which Manon and the Thirteen exited the keep proper. Manon did not hear the murmur of the crowd, did not hear the roaring wind whipping, ripping between the high turrets, did not hear the strike of hammers in the forges of the valley below. Not when her attention went to Asterin, on her knees before the matrons. She, too, was facing Manon, still in her riding leathers, her golden hair limp and knotted, flecked with blood. She lifted her face. It was only fair, Manon's grandmother drawled, the crowd silencing, for Iskra Yellowlegs to also avenge the four sentinels slaughtered on your watch. Three blows apiece for each of the sentinels killed. Twelve blows total. But from the cuts and bruises on Asterin's face, the split lip from the way she cradled her body as she bent over her knees, it had been far more than that. Slowly, Manon looked at Iskra. Cuts marred her knuckles, still raw from the beating she'd given Asterin in the dungeon. While Manon had been upstairs, brooding. Manon opened her mouth, her rage a living thing thrashing in her gut her blood, but Asterin spoke instead. Be glad to know, Manon, her second rasped with a faint, cocky smile, that she had to chain me up to beat me. Iskra's eyes flashed. You still screamed, bitch, when I whipped you. Enough, Manon's grandmother cut in, waving a hand. Manon barely heard the order. They had whipped her sentinel like some underling, like some mortal beast. Someone snarled low and vicious to her right. The breath went out of her as she found sorrel, unmovable rock, unfeeling stone, baring her teeth at Iskra, at those assembled here. Manon's grandmother stepped forward, brimming with displeasure. Behind Manon, the thirteen were a silent, unbreakable wall. Astrin began scanning their faces, and Manon realized her second understood that it was the last time she'd do so. Blood shall be paid with blood, Manon's grandmother and the yellow legs matron said in unison, reciting from their eldest rituals. Manon steeled her spine, waiting for the right moment. Any witch who wishes to extract blood in the name of Zelta yellow legs may come forward. Iron nails slid out from the hands of the yellow, uh, the entire yellow legs coven. Astrid only stared at the thirteen, her bloody face unmoved, eyes clear. The yellow legs matron said, "Form the line." Manon pounced. "I invoke the right of execution." Everyone froze. Manon's grandmother's face went pale with rage, but the other two matrons, even yellow legs, just waited. Manon said, head high, I claim the right to my second's head. Blood shall be paid with blood, but at my sword's edge. She is mine, and so shall her death be mine. For the first time, Astrin's mouth tightened, eyes gleaming. Yes, she understood the gift Manon could give her. The only honor left. It was Cressida Blueblood who cut in before the other two matrons could speak. For saving my daughter's life, wing leader, it shall be granted. The yellow legs matron whipped her head to Cressida, a retort on her lips, but it was too late. The words had been spoken, and the rules were to be obeyed at any cost. The kraken's red cape fluttering behind her in the wind, Manon dared to look at her grandmother. 
Only hatred glowed in those ancient eyes. Hatred, and a flicker of satisfaction that Astrin would be ended after decades of being deemed an unfit second. But at least this death was now hers to give. And in the east, slipping over the mountains like molten gold, the sun began to rise. A hundred years she'd had with Astrin. She'd always thought they'd have a hundred more. Manan said softly to Sorrel. Turn her around. My second shall see the dawn one last time. Sorrel obediently stepped forward, pivoting Astrin to face the High Witches, the crowd by the rail, and the rare sunrise piercing through Morath's gloom. Blood soaked through the back of her second's leathers. And yet Astrin knelt, shoulders square and head high, as she looked not at the dawn, but at Manon herself while she stalked around her second to take a place a few feet before the matrons. Some time before breakfast, Manon, her grandmother said from a few feet behind. Manon drew wind cleaver, the blade singing softly as it slid free from its sheath. The sunlight gilded the balcony as Aster and whispered, so softly that only Manon could hear. Bring my body back to the cabin. Something in Manon's chest broke, broke so violently that she wondered if it was possible for no one to have heard it. Manon lifted her sword. All it would take was one word from Asterin, and she could save her own hide. Spill Manon's secrets, her betrayals, and she'd walk free. Yet her second uttered no other word. And Manon understood in that moment that there were forces greater than obedience and discipline and brutality understood that she had not been born soulless. She had not been born without a heart. For they were both, begging her not to swing that blade. Manon looked to the thirteen, standing around Astrin in a half circle. One by one, they lifted two fingers to their brows. A murmur went through the crowd. The gesture not to honor a high witch, but a witch queen. There had not been a w queen of witches in 500 years, either among the Krakens or the Iron Teeth. Not one. Forgiveness shone in the faces of her 13. Forgiveness and understanding and loyalty that was not blind obedience, but forged in pain and battle, in shared victory and defeat, forged in hope for a better life, a better world. At last, Manon found Asterin's gaze, Tears now rolling down her second's face, not from fear or pain, but in farewell. A hundred years, and yet Manon wished she'd had more time. For a heartbeat, she thought of that sky-blue mare in the airy, the wyvern that would wait and wait for a rider who would never return. Thought of a green rocky land spreading to the western sea. Hand trembling, Astrin pressed her fingers to her brow and extended them. Bring our people home, Manon, she breathed. Manon angled wind cleaver, readying for the strike. The black, peak, the black beak matron snapped. Be done with it, Manon. Manon met Sorrel's eyes, then Astrin's, and Manon gave the thirteen her final order. Run! Then Manon black beak whirled and brought wind cleaver down upon her grandmother. And that was chapter 17. Oh my god. <laughs> um. Oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my. Yep. I couldn't contain my, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Caitlin, you're, oh heck nah. <laughs> Just so you know, Mom, Manon is spelled M-A-N-O-N. -N. Oh, okay. Manon. Oh, my god. Thank gosh. you, Caitlin, for the hydrate. I just took an extra sip for it. I'm gonna need more water here <laughs> in the next couple chapters. Uh... Oh, I bought a new fridge filter and installed it today because... It's been overdue for like a month now. It's reading. And it's like, in my water tasted gross. It's reading. And now it tastes good again. 
I know it's reading time, Mother. I like to take a break between chapters so that I can breathe. After she killed Grandmother? How do you know she killed her? She just said she brought her sword down upon her. <gasps> don't forget to take the ears off. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Because I would end up with a headache, and we don't want that. Oh, my goodness. Okay, let me, uh, so it's four, zero, six. Okay. Look. <clears throat> mm-hmm. <laughs> That's awesome, Julia. That's awesome. Okay. I also, that entire chapter was like, I know what's happening at the end of this chapter, because like I said, guys, I've read this series or listened to it on audiobook probably at more than a dozen times, at least. Um... So when I start a chapter, I kind of remember what happens in that chapter. And so I was I was waiting for everybody's reaction, too. Okay. <clears throat> On to chapter 18. Manon only saw the flash of her grandmother's rusted iron teeth, the glimmer of her iron nails as she raised them to ward against the sword. But too late. Manon slashed Windcleaver down, a blow that it would have cut most men in half. Yet her grandmother darted back fast enough that the sword sliced down her torso, ripping fabric and skin as it cut between her breasts in a shallow line. Blue blood sprayed, but the matron was moving, blocking Manon's next blow with her iron nails, iron so hard that Windcleaver bounced off. Manon did not look to see if the Thirteen obeyed, but Astrin was roaring, roaring and shouting to stop. The cries grew more distant, then echoed, as if she were now inside the hall, being dragged away. No sounds of pursuit. As if the onlookers were too stunned. Good. Iskra and Petra had swords out, iron teeth down, as they stepped between their matrons and Manon, herding the, their two high witches away. The Blackbeak matron's coven lunged forward, only to be halted by a hand. Stay back, her grandmother commanded panting as Manon circled her. Blue blood leaked down her grandmother's front. An inch closer, and she'd have been dead. Dead. Her grandmother bared her rusted teeth. She's mine. She jerked her chin at Manon. We do this the ancient way. Manon's stomach roiled, but she sheathed her sword. A flick of her wrists had her iron nails out, and a snap of her jaw had her teeth descending. Let's see how good you are, wing leader, her grandmother hissed and attacked. Manon had never seen her grandmother fight, never trained with her, and some small part of Manon wondered if it was because her grandmother did not want others to know how skilled she was. Manon could hardly move fast enough to avoid the nails ripping into her face, her neck, her gut, yielding step after step after step. She only had to do this long enough to buy the 13 time to get to the skies. Her grandmother slashed for her cheek, and Manon blocked the blow with an elbow, slamming the joint down hard into her grandmother's forearm. The witch barked in pain, and Manon spun out of reach, circling again. It's not so easy to strike now, is it, Manon Blackbeak? Her grandmother panted as they surveyed each other. No one around them dared move. The thirteen had vanished, every last one of them. She almost sagged with relief. Now to keep her grandmother occupied long enough to avoid her giving the onlookers the orders to pursue. So much easier with a blade, the weapon of those cowardly humans, her grandmother seethed. With the teeth, the nails, you have to mean it. They lunged for each other, some fundamental part of her cracking with every slash and swipe and block. They darted apart again. As pathetic as your mother, her grandmother spat. Perhaps you'll die like her, too, with my teeth at your throat. Her mother, whom she'd killed coming out of, who had died birthing her. For years I tried to train her weakness out of you. Her grandmother spat blue blood onto the stones. For the good of the iron teeth, I made you into a force of nature, a warrior equal to none. And this is how you repay me? Manon didn't let the words unnerve her. She went for the throat only to faint and slash. Her grandmother barked in pain, genuine pain, 
as Manon's claws shredded her shoulder. Blood showered her hand, flesh clinging to her nails. Manon staggered back, bile burning her throat. She saw the blow coming, but still didn't have time to stop it as her grandmother's right hand slashed across her belly. Leather, cloth, and skin ripped. Manon screamed. Blood, hot and blue, rushed out of her before her grandmother had darted back. Manon shoved a hand against her abdomen, pushing against the shredded skin. Blood dribbled through her fingers, splattering onto the stones. High above, a wyvern roared. Abraxos. The black beak matron laughed, flicking Manon's blood off her nails. I'm going to dice your wyvern into tiny pieces and feed him to the hounds. Despite the agony in her belly, Manon's vision honed. Not if I kill you first. Her grandmother chuckled, still circling, assessing. You are stripped of your title as wing leader. You are stripped of your title as heir. Step after step, closer and closer, an adder looping around its prey. From this day, you are Manon Witch Killer, Manon Kinslayer. The words pelted her like stones. <clears throat> Manon backed toward the balcony rail, pushing against the wound in her stomach to keep the blood in. The crowd parted like water around them. Just a little longer. Just another minute or two. Her grandmother paused, blinking toward the open doors, as if realizing the Thirteen had vanished. Manon attacked again before she could give the order to pursue. Swipe, lunge, slash, duck. They moved in a whirlwind of iron and blood and leather. But as Manon twisted away, the wounds in her stomach gave more, and she stumbled. Her grandmother didn't miss a beat. She struck. Not with her nails or teeth, but with her foot. To kick to Manon, the kick to Manon's stomach set her screaming. A roar again answered by Abraxos, locked high above. Soon to die, as she would. She prayed the Thirteen would spare him, let him join them wherever they would flee. Manon slammed to the stone rail of the balcony and crumbled to the black tiles. Blue blood leaked from her, staining the thighs of her pants. Her grandmother slowly approached, panting. Manon grabbed the balcony rail, hauling herself to her feet one last time. Do you want to know a secret, Kinslayer? Her grandmother breathed. Manon slumped against the balcony rail, the drop below endless and a relief. They'd take her to the dungeons, either use her for Erewhon's breeding, or torture her until she begged for death. Maybe both. Her grandmother spoke so softly that even Manon could barely hear her, hear over her own gasps of for air. As your mother labored to push you out, she confessed who your father was. She said you, you would be the one who broke the curse, who saved us. She said your father was a rare-born Kraken prince, and she said that your mixed blood would be the key. Her grandmother lifted her nails to her mouth and licked off Manon's blue blood. No. No. So you have been a kinslayer your whole life, her grandmother purred, hunting down those krakens, your relatives. When you were a witchling, your father searched the lands for you. He never stopped loving your mother. Loving her, she spat, and loving you. So I killed him. Manon gazed at the drop below, the death that beckoned. His despair was delicious when I told him what I'd done to her, what I would make you into. Not a child of peace, but war. Made. 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 Manon's iron nails chipped on the dark stone of the balcony rail, and then her grandmother said the words that broke her. Do you know why that kraken was spying in the Farian Gap this spring? She had been sent to find you. After a hundred and sixteen years of searching, they had finally learned the identity of their dead prince's lost child. Her grandmother's smile was hideous in its absolute triumph. Manon willed strength to her arms, to her legs. Her name was Rhiannon, after the last Kraken queen. And she was your half-sister. She confessed it to me upon our tables. She thought it'd save her life. 
and when she saw what you had become, she chose to let the knowledge die with her. I am a black beak, Manon rasped, blood choking her words. Her grandmother took a step, smiling as she crooned. You are a Kraken, the last of their royal bloodline with the death of your sister at your own hand. You are a Kraken queen. Absolute silence from the witches gathered. Her grandmother reached for her. And you are going to die like one by the time I am finished with you. Manon didn't let her grandmother's nails touch her. A boom sounded nearby. Manon used the strength she'd gathered in her arms, her legs, to hurl herself onto the stone ledge of the balcony and roll off it into the open air. <sighs> air and rock and wind and blood. Manon slammed into a warm, leathery hide, screaming as pain from her wounds blacked out her vision. Above, somewhere far away, her grandmother was shrieking orders. Manon dug her nails into the leathery hide, burying her claws deep. Beneath her, a bark of discomfort she recognized. Abraxos. But she held firm, and he embraced the pain as he banked to the side, swerving out of Morath's shadow. She felt them around her. Manon managed to open her eyes, flicking the clear lid against the wind into place. Edda and Briar, her shadows, were now flanking her. She knew they'd been there, waiting in the shadows with their wyverns, had heard every one of those damning last words. The others have flown ahead. We were sent to retrieve you. Edda, the eldest of the sisters, shouted over the roar of the wind. Your wound. It's shallow. Manon snapped, forcing the pain aside to focus on the task at hand. She was on Abraxos's neck, the saddle a few feet behind her. One by one, every breath in agony, she released her nails from his skin and slid toward the saddle. He evened out his flight, offering smooth air to buckle herself into the harness. Blood leaked from the gouges in her belly. Soon the saddle was slick with it. Behind them, several roars sent the mountains trembling. We can't let them get to the others, Manon managed to say. Briar, black hair streaming behind her, swept in closer. Six yellow legs on our tail, from Iskra's parsonal coven, closing in fast. With a score to settle, they'd no doubt been given free reign to slaughter them. Manon surveyed the peaks and ravines of the mountains around them. Two apiece, she ordered. The shadow's black wyverns were enormous, skilled at stealth, but devastating in a fight. Edda, you drive two to the west. Briar, you slam the other two to the east. Leave the last two to me. No sign of the rest of the thirteen in the gray clouds or mountains. Good. They had gotten away. It was enough. You kill them, then you find the others, Manon ordered, an arm draped over her wound. But, wing leader! The title almost stapped her will. But Manon barked. That's an order. The shadows bowed their heads, then, as if sharing one mind, one heart, they banked to either direction, peeling away from Anon like petals in the wind. Bloodhounds on a scent, four yellow legs split from their group to deal with each shadow. The two in the center flew faster, harder, spreading apart to close in on Manon. Her vision blurred. Not a good sign. Not a good sign at all. She breathed to Abraxos. Let's make it a final stand worthy of song. He bellowed in answer. The yellow legs swept near enough for Manon to count their weapons. A battle cry shattered from the one to her right. Manon dug her left heel into Abraxos' side. Like a shooting star, he blasted down toward the peaks of the ashy mountains. The yellow legs dove with them. Manon aimed for a ravine running through the spine of the mountain range, her vision flashing black and white and foggy. A chill crept into her bones. The walls of the ravine closed around them like the maw of a mighty beast, and she pulled on the reins once. Abraxos flung out his wings and coasted along the side of the ravine, before catching a current and leveling out, flapping like hell through the heart of the crevice, pillars of stone jutting from the floor like lances. The yellow legs, too ensnared in their bloodlust, their wyverns too large and bulky, balked at the ravine. At the sharp turn, a boom and a screech, and the whole ravine shuddered. Manon swallowed her bark of agony to peer behind. 
One of the wyverns had panicked, too big for the space, and slammed into a stone column. Broken bone and blood rained down. But the other wyvern had managed to bank, and now sailed toward them, wings so wide they nearly grazed either side of the ravine. Manon panted through her bloody teeth. Fly, Abraxos! And her gentle, warrior-hearted mount flew. Manon focused on keeping to the saddle, on keeping the arm pressed against her wound to hold the blood in. Keep that lethal cold away. She'd gotten enough injuries to know her grandmother had struck deep and true. The ravine swerved right, and Abraxos took the turn with expert skill. She prayed for the boom and roar of the pursuing wyvern to hit the walls. But none came. But Manon knew these deadly cannons. Canyons. She'd flown this path countless times on the endless, inane patrols these months. The yellow legs sequestered in the Farian Gap did not. To the very end, Abraxos, she said. His war was his only confirmation. One shot. She'd have one shot. Then she could gladly die, knowing the Thirteen would, wouldn't be pursued. Not today, at least. Turn after turn, Abraxos hurtled through the ravine, snapping his own tail against the rock to send debris flying into the yellow leg sentinel. The rider dodged the rocks, her wyvern bobbing on the wind. Closer. Manon needed her closer. She tugged on Abraxos' reins, and he checked his speed. Turn after turn after turn, black rock flashing by, blurring like her own fading vision. The yellow legs was near enough to throw a dagger. Manon looked over her shoulder with her failing eyesight in time to see her do just that. Not one dagger, but two, metal gleaming in the dim canyon light. Manon braced herself for the impact of metal in flesh and bone. Abraxos took the final turn as the sentinel hurled her daggers at Manon. A towering, impenetrable wall of black stone arose, mere feet away. But Abraxos soared up catching the updraft and sailing out of the heart of the ravine, so close Manon could touch the dead-end wall. The two daggers struck the rock where Manon had been moments before, and the yellow-legged sentinel on her bulky, heavy wyvern did as well. Rock groaned as wyvern and rider splattered against it and fell to the ravine floor. Panting, her breath a wet, bloody rasp, Manon patted Abraxos aside. Even the motion was feeble. Good she managed to say. Mountains became small again. Oakwald spread before her. Trees, the cover of trees might hide her. Oak, she rasped. Manon didn't finish the command before the darkness swept in to claim her. And that was chapter 18. Mm-hmm. We will be switching back to Tower of Dawn. So if you are reading along, make sure you get your Tower of Dawn books out now. Mickey's friend redeemed hydrate. Thank you. Okay, Caitlin. If it does die, this is me also telling you good night. Oh, my back is wet from my wet hair because I just showered before stream. And with it being pressed between the seat and myself, now my shirt's wet. Can you check charger? A charger? Not being connected to the Wi-Fi is causing my battery to drain really fast. You can connect to the new Wi-Fi. It's called the Pentagon. <laughs> but I do have a cord. Yes, I just don't... What? Yeah, I, I got it. I do have a cord. I just don't have a box. I'd have to get up and go get a box. 
get one for someone like that. Um, on the kitchen counter is my lunchbox. In the side pouch of my lunchbox, there's glasses case, I've proven, and then there's a phone cord. Grab that out, take the box off of it, because that cord will work for your phone. Oh. Okay, now I gotta put my setup back together because I had to move a bunch of shit so I could get the cord out. Okay. We are picking up with chapter 13 of Tower of Dawn. The cord's there. Um, Got it. You know where to plug it in. Yep. So. <clears throat> chapter 13 of Tower of Dawn. Sorry, I had a piece of skin hanging off my finger and it was driving me crazy. <sighs> Irene panted, her legs sprawled before her on the rug, her back resting against the couch on which Lord West- Lord Let me restart that sentence. I don't know why I got so tongue-tied. Irene panted, her legs sprawled before her on the rug, her back resting against the couch on which Lord Kaol now gasped for breath as well. Her mouth was dry as sand, her limbs trembling so violently that she could barely keep her hands limp in her lap. A spitting sound, and a little thump told her he'd removed the bit. He'd roared around it. His bellowing had been almost as bad as the magic itself. It was a void. It was a new, dark hell. Her magic had been a pulsing star that flared against the wall of that the darkness had the wall that the darkness had crafted between the top of his spine and the rest of it. She knew, knew without testing, that if she bypassed it, jump right to the base of his spine, it would find her there too. But she had pushed, pushed and pushed until she was sobbing for breath. Still, that wall did not move. It only seemed to laugh, quietly and sibilantly. The sound laced with ancient ice and malice. She hurled her magic against the wall, letting its swarm of burning white lights attack in wave after wave, but nothing. And only at the end, when her magic could find no crack, no crevice to slide into, only when she made to pull back did that dark wall seem to transform, to morph into something... Other. Irene's magic had turned brittle before it. Any spark of defiance in the wake of that healer's death had cooled. And she could not see, did not dare to look at what she felt gathering there. What filled the dark with voices, as if they were echoing down a long hall. But it had loomed, and she had slid a glance over her shoulder. The dark wall was alive, swimming with images one after another, as if she were looking through someone's eyes. She knew on instinct they did not belong to Lord Kaol. A fortress of dark stone jutted up amid ash-colored, barren mountains. Its towers sharp as lances, its edges and parapets hard and slicing. Beyond it, coating the vales and plains amid the mountains, an army rippled away into the distance. More campfires than she could count. And she, the knew, she knew the name for this place. The assembled host. Heard the name thunder through her mind as if it were the beat of a hammer on anvil. Morath. She pulled out, had yanked herself back into the light and heavy heat. Morath. Whether it was some true memory left by whatever power had struck him, whether it was something the darkness conjured from her own darkest terrors. Not real. At least not in this room. With its steaming, streaming sunlight and chattering fountain in the garden beyond. But if it was indeed a true portrayal of the armies that Lord Kale had mentioned yesterday, that was what she would face. The victims of that host, possibly even the soldiers within it, should things go very wrong. That was what awaited her back home. Not now. She would not think of this now. With him here. Fretting about it. Reminding him of what he must face. What might be sweeping down upon his friends as they sat here. Not helpful to either of them. So Irene sat there on the rug, 
forcing her trembling to abate with each deep breath she inhaled through her nose and out her mouth, letting her magic settle and refill within her as she calmed her mind, letting Lord Kaol pant on the couch behind her, neither of them saying a word. No, this would not be a usual healing. But perhaps delaying her return, remaining here to heal him for however long it took. There might be others like him on those battlefields, suffering from similar injuries. Learning to face this now, however harrowing. Yes, this delay might turn fruitful. If she could stomach, if she could endure that darkness again, find some way to shatter it. Go where you fear to tread. Indeed. Her eyes drifted closed. At some point, the servant girl had come back with the ingredients Irene had invented, had taken one look at them, and vanished. It had been hours ago. Days ago. Hunger was a tight knot in her belly. A strangely mortal feeling compared to the hours spent attacking that blackness. Only half aware of the hand she'd placed on his back, of the screaming that came from him every time her magic shoved against that wall. He had not once asked her to stop had not begged for reprieve. Shaking fingers brushed her shoulder. Are you? Each of his words were a burnt rasp. She'd have to get him peppermint tea with honey. She should call to the servant, if she could remember to speak, muster the voice herself. <clears throat> All right. Irene cracked her eyelids open as his hand settled on her shoulder. Not from any affection or concern, but because she had a feeling that the exhaustion lay so heavily upon him that he couldn't move it again. And she was drained enough that she couldn't muster the strength to brush off that touch, as she'd done earlier. I should ask you if you're all right, she managed to say, voice raw. Anything? No. The sheer lack of emotion behind the word told her enough of his thoughts, his disappointment. He paused for a few heartbeats before he repeated, No. She closed her eyes again. This could take weeks, months, especially if she did not find some way to shove back that wall of darkness. She tried and failed to move her legs. I should get you rest. The hand tightened on her shoulder. Rest, he said again. You're done for the day, she said. No additional exercise. I mean you. Rest. Each word was labor. <clears throat> Irene dragged her stare toward the large clock in the corner. Blinked once. Twice. Five. They had been here for five hours. He had endured it all that time. Five hours of this agony. The thought alone had her drawing up her legs, groaning as she braced a hand on the low-lying table and rallied her strength, pushing up up until she was standing weaving on her feet but standing his arms slid beneath him the muscles of his bare back rippling as he tried to push himself up don't she said he did so anyway the considerable muscles in his arms and chest did not fail him as he shoved upward until he was sitting staring at her glassy-eyed irene rasped you need tea kaja the name was little more than a push of breath. The servant immediately appeared. Too quickly. Irene studied her closely as the girl slipped in. She'd been listening. Waiting. Irene did not bother to smile as she said. Peppermint tea. Lots of honey. Kale added. Two of them. Irene gave him a look, but sank onto the couch beside him. The cushions were slightly damp. With his sweat, she realized, as she saw it gleaming on the contours of his bronze chest. She shut her eyes. Just for a moment. She didn't realize it was far lo longer until... She didn't realize it was far longer than that until Kaja was setting two delicate teacups before them, a small iron kettle steaming in the center of the table. The woman poured generous amounts of honey into both, and Irene's mouth was too dry tongue too heavy to bother telling her to stop, or she'd make them ill from the sweetness. The servant stirred both in silence, then handed the first cup to Kaol. He merely passed it to Irene. She was too tired to object as she wrapped her hands around it, trying to rally the strength to raise it to her lips. He seemed to sense it. He told Kaja to leave his cup on the table, told her to go. 
Irene watched as through a distant window, while Kale took her cup and lifted it to her lips. She debated shoving his hand out of her face. Yes, she'd work with him. No, he was not the monster she had initially expected he'd be. Not in the way she'd seen men be. But letting him this close, letting him tend to her like this. You can either drink it, he said, his voice a low growl, or we can sit like this for the next few hours. She slid her eyes to him, found his stare to be level, clear despite the exhaustion. She said nothing. So that's the line, Kaol murmured more to himself than her. You can stomach helping me, but I can't return the favor, or can't do anything that steps beyond your idea of what, who I am. He was more astute than most people likely gave him credit for. She had a feeling the hardness in his rich brown eyes was mirrored in her own. Drink. Pure command laced his voice. A man used to being obeyed, to giving orders. Resent me all you want, but drink the damn thing. And it was the faint kernel of worry in his eyes. A man used to being obeyed, yes, but a man also inclined to care for others. Look after them. Driven to do it by a compulsion he couldn't leash, couldn't train out of him, couldn't have broken out of him. Irene parted her lips, a silent yielding. Gently, he set the porcelain teacup against her mouth and tipped it for her. She sipped once. He murmured in encouragement. She did so again. So tired. She had never been so tired in her life. Kale pushed the cup against her mouth a third time, and she drank a full gulp. Enough. He needed it more than she did. He sensed she was likely about to bark at him, withdrew the cup from her mouth, and merely sipped it. One gulp. Two. He drained it and grabbed the other one, offering her the first sips again before he took the dregs. Insufferable man. Irene must have said as much, because a half-smile kicked up on one side of his face. You're not the first to call me that, he said, his voice smoother. Less hoarse. It won't be the last, I'm sure, she muttered. Kale simply gave her that half-smile again and stretched to refill both cups. He added the honey himself, less than Kaja had. The right amount. He stirred them, his hands steady. I can do it, Irene tried to say. So can I, was all he said. She managed to hold the cup this time. He made sure she was well into drinking hers before he lifted his own to his cup, to his lips. I should go. The thought of getting out of the palace, let alone the trek to the Torre, then the walk up the stairs to her rooms. Rest. Eat. You must be starving. She eyed him. You're not? He'd exercised heavily before she'd arrived. He had to be famished from that alone. I am, but I don't think I can wait for dinner, he added. You could join me. It was one thing to heal him, work with him, let him serve her tea, but to dine with him, the man who had served that butcher, the man who had worked for him while that dark army was amassed down in Morath. There it was. That smoke in her nose, the crackle of flame and screaming. Irene leaned forward to set her cup on the table, then stood. Every movement was stiff, sore. I need to return to the Torre, she said, her knees wobbling. The vigil is at sundown. Still a good hour from now, thankfully. He noted her swaying and reached for her, but she stepped out of his range. I'll leave the supplies, because the thought of lugging that heavy bag back. Let me arrange a carriage for you. I can ask at the front gate, she said. If someone was hunting her, she'd opt for the safety of a carriage. She had to grip the furniture as she passed to keep upright. This distance to the door seemed eternal. Irene. She could barely stand at the door, but she paused to look back. The lesson tomorrow. The focus had already returned to those brown eyes. Where do you want me to meet you? She debated calling it off. Wondered what she'd been thinking. Asking him of all people to come. But. Five hours. Five hours of agony and he had not broken. Perhaps it was for that alone that she had declined dinner. If he had not broken, then she would not break. Not in seeing him as anything but what he was. What he'd served. I'll meet you in the main courtyard at sunrise. 
Mustering the strength to walk it was an effort. But she did it. Put one foot in front of the other. Left him alone in that room, still staring after her. Five hours of agony and she'd known it had not all been physical. She had sensed, shoving against that wall, that the darkness had also showed him things on the other side of it. Glimmers had sometimes shivered past her. Nothing she could make out, but they felt... They had felt like memories. Nightmares. Perhaps both. Yet he had not asked her to stop. And part of Irene wondered, as she trudged through the palace, if Lord Kale had not asked her to stop, not just because he'd learned how to manage pain, but also because he somehow felt he deserved it. Everything hurt. Kale did not let himself think about what he had seen, what had flashed through his mind as that pain had racked him, burned and flayed and shattered him. What and who he'd seen. The body on the bed. The collar on her throat. The head that had rolled. He could not escape them. Not while Irene had worked. So the pain had ripped through him. So he had seen it. Over and over. So he had roared and screamed and bellowed. She stopped only when she'd slid to the floor. He'd been left hollow. Void. She still had not wanted to spend more than a moment necessary with him. He didn't blame her. Not that it mattered. Though he reminded himself that she'd asked him to help tomorrow. In whatever way he could. Kale ate his meal where Irene had left him. Still in his undershorts. Kaja didn't seem to notice or care. And he was too aching and tired to bother with modesty. Aelin would likely have laughed to see him now. The man who had stumbled out of her room after she declared that her cycle had arrived. Now sitting in this fine room, mostly naked and not giving a shit about it. Nestrin returned before sundown, her face flushed and hair wind-blown. One look at her tentative smile told him enough. At least she'd been somewhat successful with Sartak. Perhaps she'd managed to do what it seemed he himself was failing to, raising a host to bring back home. He'd meant to speak to the Kakan today, about the threat last night's attack had posed. Meant to, and it was now late enough to prevent arranging such a meeting. He barely heard Nesrin as she whispered about Sartak's possible sympathy, her ride on his magnificent rook. Exhaustion weighed on him so heavily he could hardly keep his eyes open, even while he pictured those rooks soaring off, squaring off against iron teeth witches and wyverns, even while he debated who might survive each such battles. But he managed to give the order that curled on his tongue. Go hunting, Nesrin. If one of Erwin's Vogg minions had indeed come to Antica, time was not on their side. Every step, every request, might be reported back to Erwan. And if they were pursuing Irene, either for reading up on the Vogg, or for heading to the- or for healing the hand to the King of Adderlin. He didn't trust anyone here enough to ask them to do this, other than Nesrin. Nesrin had nodded at his request had understood why he'd nearly spat it out to let her go into danger, to hunt that sort of danger. But she'd done it before in Rifthold. She'd reminded him of that, gently. Sleep beckoned, turning his body foreign and heavy, but he managed to make his final request. Be careful. Kale didn't resist when she helped him into the chair, then wheeled him into his room. He tried and failed to lift himself into the bed, and was only vaguely aware of her and Kaja hauling him onto it like a slab of meat. Irene. She never did such things. Never wheeled him when he could do so himself. Constantly told him to move himself instead. He wondered why. Was too damn tired to wonder why. Nesrin said she would make his apologies at dinner, and went to change. He wondered if the servants heard the whine of the whetstone against her blades from her bedroom door. He was asleep before she left, the clock in the sitting room distantly chiming seven. No one paid Nesrin much heed at dinner that night, and no one paid her any heed later when she donned her fighting knives, sword, and bow, and quiver, and slipped into the city streets. Not even the Kagan's wife. As Nesrin stalked by a large stone garden on her way out of the palace, a glimmer of white caught her eye and sent her ducking behind one of the pillars flanking the courtyard. Within a heartbeat, she removed her hand from the long knife at her side. Clad in white silk, 
her long curtain of dark hair unbound. The Grand Empress strolled, silent and grave as a wraith, down a walkway wending through the rock formations of the garden. Only moonlight filled the space, moonlight and shadow, as the Empress strode along, strode alone and unnoticed, her simple gown flowing behind her as if on a phantom wind. White for grief, for death. The Grand Empress's face was unadorned, her coloring far paler than that of her children. No joy limbed her features, no life, no interest in either. Nesrin lingered in the shadows of the pillar, watching the woman drift farther away, as if she were wandering the paths of some dreamscape, or perhaps some empty, barren hell. Nesrin wondered if it was at all this similar to the ones she herself had walked during those initial months after her mother's passing. Wondered if the days also bled together for the Grand Empress, if food was ash on her tongue and sleep was both craved and elusive. Only when the Kagan's wife strode behind a large boulder, vanishing from sight, did Nesrin continue on, her steps a little heavier. Antica under the full moon was a wash of blues and silvers, interrupted by the golden glow of lanterns hanging from public dining rooms, and the carts of vendors selling cave and treats. A few performers plucked out melodies on lutes and drums, a few gifted enough to make Nesrin wish she could pause, but stealth and speed were her allies tonight. She stalked through the shadows, sorting through the sounds of the city. Various temples were interspersed among the main thoroughfares, some crafted of marble pillars, some beneath peaked wooden roofs and painted columns, some mere courtyards filled with pools or rock gardens or sleeping animals. Thirty-six gods watched over this city, and there were thrice as many temples to them scattered throughout. And with each one Nestrin passed, she wondered if those gods were peering out from the pillars or behind the carved rocks, if they watched from the eaves of that sloped roof, or from behind the spotted cat's eyes where it lay half awake on the temple steps. She beseeched all of them to make her feet swift and silent, to guide her where she needed to go while she prowled the streets. If a Volg agent had come to this continent, or worse, a possible Volg prince, Nesrin scanned the rooftops in the gargantuan pillar of the Torre. It gleamed bone white in the moonlight, a beacon watching over the city, the healers within. Kale and Irene had made no progress today, but it was fine. Nesrin reminded herself again and again that it was fine. These things took a while, even if Irene... It was clear she had some personal reservations regarding Kale's heritage, his former role in the Empire. Nesrin paused near an alley entrance while a band of young revelers staggered past, singing body songs that would surely make her aunt scold them, and later hum along herself. As she monitored the alley, the bordering, flat rooftops, Nesrin's attention snagged on a rough carving in the earthen brick wall. An owl at rest, its wings tucked in, those unearthly large eyes wide and eternally unblinking. Perhaps no more than vandalism, Yet she brushed a gloved hand over it, tracing the lines etched into the building's side. Antica's owls. They were everywhere in the city. Tribute to the goddess, worshipped perhaps more than any other of the th 36. No chief god ruled the southern continent. Yet Silba. Nesrin again studied the mighty tower, shining brighter than the palace on the opposite end of the city. Silba reigned unchallenged here. For anyone to break into that torre, to kill one of the healers, they had to be desperate, or utterly insane, or a Volg demon with no fear of the gods, only of their master's wrath if they should fail. But if she were a Volg in this city, where to hide, where to lurk? Canals ran beneath some of the homes, but it was not like the vast sewer network of Rifthold. Yet perhaps if she studied the Torre's walls, Nesrin aimed for the gleaming tower, the Torre looming with each nearing step. She paused in the shadows beside one of the homes across the street from the solid wall that enclosed the Torre's entire compound. Torches flickered along brackets in the pale wall, guards stationed every few feet, and atop it, royal guards judging from their colors, and Torre guards in their cornflower blue and yellow. So many that none would get by without notice. Nesrin studied the iron gates, now sealed for the night. Were they open last night is the answer no guard wants to yield. Nesrin whirled, her knife angled low and up. Prince Sartak leaned against the building wall a few feet behind her. 
his gaze on the looming tore. Twin swords peaked above his broad shoulders, and long knives hung from his belt. He'd changed from the finery of dinner back into his flying leathers, again reinforced with steel at the shoulders, silver gauntlets at his wrists, and a black scarf at his neck. No, not a scarf, but a cloth to pull over his mouth and nose when the heavy hood of his cloak was on, to remain anonymous, unmarked. She sheathed her knife. Were you following me? The prince flicked his dark, calm eyes to her. You didn't exactly try to be inconspicuous when you left through the front gate, armed to the teeth. Nesrin turned toward the torre walls. I have no reason to hide what I'm doing. You think whoever attacked the healers is just going to be strolling around? His boots were barely a scrape against the ancient stones as he approached her side. I thought to investigate how they might have gotten in, get a better sense of the layout, and where they'd likely find appealing to hide. A pause. You sound as if you know your prey intimately. And didn't think to mention this to me during our ride this morning, was the unspoken rest. Nestrin glanced sidelong at Sartak. I wish I could say otherwise, but I do, if the attack was made by whom we suspect. I spent much of this spring and summer hunting their kind in Riftfold. Sartak watched the wall for a long minute. He said quietly, How bad was it? Nasrin swallowed as the images flickered, the bodies and the sewers and the glass castle exploding, a wall of death flying for her. Captain Felique. A gentle prod, a softer tone than she'd expect from a warrior prince. What did your spies tell you? Sartek's jaw tightened, shadows crossing his face before he said, They reported that Rifthold was full of terrors, people who were not people, beasts from Vanth Starkest streams. Vamp, goddess of the dead. Her presence in this city predated even Silba's healers. Her worshippers a secretive sect that even the Kagan and his predecessors feared and respected, despite her rituals being wholly different from the eternal sky to which the Kagan and the Dargan believed they returned. Nesrin had walked swiftly past Vamp's dark stoned temple earlier, the entrance marked only by a set of onyx steps descending into a subterranean chamber lit with bone-white candles. I can see that none of this sounds outlandish to you, said Sartak. A year ago, it might have. Sartak's gaze swept over her weapons. So you truly face such horrors then? Yes, Nasrin admitted. For whatever good it did, considering the city is now held by them. The words came out as bitterly as they felt. Sartak considered. Most would have fled rather than face them at all. She didn't feel like confirming or denying such a statement. No doubt meant to console her. A kind effort from a man who did not need to do such things. She found herself saying, I... I saw your mother earlier, walking alone through a garden. Her tax eyes shuddered. Oh? A careful question. Nesrin wondered if she perhaps should have held her tongue. But she continued. I only mention it because, in case... In case it is something you might need... Might want to know. Was there a guard? A hand maiden with her? None that I saw. That was indeed worry tightening his face as he leaned against the wall of the building. Thank you for the report. It was not her place to ask about it, not for anyone, and certainly not for the most powerful family in the world, but Nesrin said quietly. My mother died when I was thirteen. She gazed up at the near glowing Tore. The old king. You know what he did with those with magic to healers gifted with it. So there was no one who could save my mother from the wasting sickness that crept up on her. The healers we managed to find admitted to us that it was likely from a growth inside my mother's breast, that she might have been able to cure her before magic vanished, before it was forbidden. She had never told anyone outside of her family this story. Wasn't sure why she was really telling him now, but she went on. My father wanted to get her on a boat to sail here, was desperate to, but war had broken out up and down our lands, ships were conscripted into Adeline's service, and she was too sick to ra risk a land journey all the way down to Eelway to try to cross there. My father combed through every map, every trade route, by the time he found a merchant who would sail with them, just the two of them, to Antica. My mother was too sick she could not be moved. She would not have made it here, 
even if they'd gotten on a boat. Sartak watched her, face unreadable, while she spoke. Nasrin slid her hands into her pockets. So she stayed. And we were all there when she... When it was over. That old grief wrapped around her, burning her eyes. It took me a few years to feel right again, she said after a moment. Two years before I started noticing things like the sun on my face or the taste of food. Started enjoying them again. My father, he held us together. My sister and I. If he mourned, he did not let us see it. He filled our house with as much joy as he could. She fell silent, unsure how to explain what she meant by starting down this road. Sartak said at last, Where are they now, after the attack on Riftold? I don't know, she whispered, blowing out a breath. They got out, but I don't know where they fled, or if they will be able to make it here, with so many horrors filling the world. Sartak fell quiet for a moment, and Nesrin spent every second of it wishing she just kept her mouth shut. Then the prince said, I will send word discreetly, he pushed off the wall, for my spies to keep an eye out for the Felique family, and to aid them should they pass their way, in any form they can, to safer harbors. Her chest tightened to the point of pain, but she managed to say, Thank you. It was a generous offer. More than generous. Sartak added, I am sorry for your loss, as long ago as it was. I, as a warrior, I grew up walking hand in hand with death, and yet this one. It has been harder to endure than others, and my mother's grief perhaps even harder to face than my own. He shook his head, the moonlight dancing on his black hair, and said with forced lightness, Why do you think I was so eager to run out after you into the night? Nesrin, despite herself, offered him a slight smile in return. Sartak lifted a brow. Though, it would help to know what exactly I'm supposed to be looking for. Nesrin debated what to tell him, debated his very presence here. He gave a low, soft laugh when her hesitation went on a moment too long. You think I'm the one who attacked that healer? After I was the one who told you about it this morning? Nesrin bowed her head. I mean no disrespect. Even if she'd seen another prince enslaved this spring, had fired an arrow at a queen to keep him alive. Your spies were correct. Rifthold was... I would not wish to see Antica suffer through anything similar. And you're convinced the attack at the Torre was just the start? I'm out here, aren't I? Silence. Nesrin added, If anyone, familiar or foreign, offers you a black ring or collars, if you see anyone with something like it, do not hesitate. Not for a heartbeat. Strike fast and true. Beheading is the only thing that keeps them down. The person within them is gone. Don't try to save them, or it will be you who winds up enslaved as well. Sartak's attention drifted to the sword at her side, the bow and quiver strapped to her back. He said quietly, Tell me everything you know. I can't. The refusal alone could end her life, but Sartak nodded thoughtfully. Tell me what you can, then. So she did. Standing in the shadows beyond the Torre walls, she explained everything she could save for the keys and gates and Dorian's enslavement, as well as that of the former king. When she'd finished, Sartak's face had not changed, though he rubbed at his jaw. When did you plan to tell my father this? As soon as he'd grant us a private meeting. Sartag swore, low and creative. With my sister's death, it's been harder for him than he'll admit to return to our usual rhythms. He will not take my counsel, or anyone else's. It was the worry in the prince's tone, and sorrow, that made Nesrin say, I'm sorry. Sartag shook his head. I must think on what you told me. There are places within this continent, near my people's homeland. He rubbed at his neck. When I was a boy, they told stories at the Ares of similar horrors, he said, more to himself than her. Perhaps it is time I paid my hearth mother a visit, to hear her stories again, and ha how that ancient threat was dealt with long ago, especially if it is now stirring once more. A record of the Vog? Here? Her family had never told her any such tales. But then her own people had hailed from distant reaches of the continent. If the Rook Riders had somehow either known of the Vogue or even faced them. 
Footsteps scuffed on the street beyond, and they pressed into the walls of the alley, hands on their sword hilts. But it was only a drunk stumbling home for the night, saluting the Tode guards along the wall as he passed, earning a few laughing grins in return. Are there canals beneath here, nearby sewers that might connect to the Tode? Her question was little more than a push of air. I don't know, Sartak admitted with equal quiet. He smiled grimly as he pointed toward an ancient grate in the sloped stones of the alley. But it would be my honor to accompany you in discovering one. And that was chapter 13, and where we are going to wrap it up for tonight as the next chapter, or sorry, chapter 13, not 14. Um, but that is where we're going to wrap it up for the night, because the next chapter is quite lengthy. Um, and of course, here is the guide for reference. So we just finished up Tower of Dawn, chapter 13. So next stream, we will be picking back up with Tower of Dawn, chapter 14, and continuing on with Tower of Dawn for a few chapters before switching back over to Empire of Storms.